Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Dr. Rebecca Tuvel. She is Associate Professor and Chair of Philosophy at Rhodes College. She works in feminist philosophy, philosophy of race, and the ethics of identity. She has a book project titled Changing Race, the Ethics and Metaphysics of Transracialism, which will explore the possibility and permissibility of changing one's race. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today and also about feminism, cultural appropriation, and also, if we get the time to do it, animal ethics. So, Dr. Tiuvel, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, let's start with feminism then, because I guess that over time, since feminist, feminism has been around, there's been several waves of feminism and there's different... Uh, theories surrounding feminists, there are, uh, feminism, there are different kinds of feminists out there. But for you, what does it really mean to be a feminist? So for me, being a feminist means fighting gender inequality and discrimination. So historically, feminists have fought you know, for women's right to vote, for women's right to own property, to file for a divorce, to legally accuse their husbands of rape. And today's feminists fight different battles depending on where they're located. So globally, we have many feminists still fighting for basic rights for young girls and women, like the right to an education. They're fighting against forced female genital cutting against sex trafficking, um, against child marriage. And in the West, uh, you know, feminists still also fight different battles. Many feminists fight against uh, gender norms that teach young girls and women that their main value lies in their ability to land a husband and bear children. You know, in the US right now, many feminists are fighting for women's reproductive rights uh, while abortion bans sweep across the nation. So the, the fight continues. So let me ask you another kind of question then. Why do you think that uh, apparently there are so few people, including women, that identify themselves as feminists nowadays? Good question. So I think there are a lot of reasons why so few people identify as feminists. One is that there are still a lot of stereotypes out there about feminists. So feminists are all angry, loudmouthed man haters who want to take over the world. Didn't you know, didn't you know that? Um, so stereotypes certainly um, are part of the problem. I also think that in, in the US and in the West more broadly, there are a lot of people who think feminism won. You know, the sexes are equal. We don't have formal barriers anymore to women's success. So we don't need feminism. In fact, some people go so far as to argue that if you look at the data, men are worse off. Uh, young boys and men are now worse off. And so what we need to be doing is fighting more for men. So um, philosophers like David Benatar have argued this point and, and others certainly are making that point too. And then I, I think also because the history of feminism has not always been inclusive, especially of women of color and of folks across the gender spectrum, there are a lot of people who just feel feminism isn't for them. Um, and so they feel like that's not my movement. Uh, yeah, there, there are even people that say or claim that feminism and other uh, civil and social movements are already kind of obsolete, but <laughs> apparently, and particularly with recently some of the challenges to reproductive rights in the US specifically, I mean, it doesn't seem to be the case, right? Yes, yes, I would agree for sure. And I would argue further that, you know, feminism properly defined is the movement that challenges 
all types of pernicious gender norms and stereotypes. So, you know, any feminism worth its salt is not an anti-male feminism. It's a feminism that's also concerned about the plight of boys and men, and that seeks to combat toxic masculinity, for instance, or the expectation for men to be, you know, aggressive and dominant, not to cry. I mean, those are things that are not only bad for women, they're bad for men too. And feminists should be concerned about them. And many, of course, are. And uh, I mean, that exact same point I've heard from other feminists saying that uh, I mean, when people accuse them of not caring about um, men's issues, some of them even say something along the lines of, look, but uh, patriarchy, for example, we think it also affects men or most men a lot in many different ways, particularly through, for example, forcing gender roles on them that might have many different kinds of pernicious psychological and other kinds of effects, for example. Precisely. Uh, so uh, you've already answered this question a little bit, I guess, but uh, since feminism has gone through several different iterations over time, uh, what would you say it means to be a feminist today? specifically and uh, I mean do you think that feminism has changed a lot over time through the first second third waves and so on yes I think feminism has changed a lot over time I mean even just if we focus on the US you know the the type of battle that feminists are fighting has changed again from fighting more formal kinds of inequality, like women cannot mm -hmm. vote, for instance, to fighting more informal or, you know, subtle forms of discrimination, like the ways that sexist bias um, functions. It's also certainly become more inclusive. So, you know, intersectionality has made a big difference to how feminists think of their battle. So this is a term coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw to draw our attention to, you know, overlapping forms of discrimination and inequality. Um, one famous case she discusses is that of General Motors in the 1970s. So they were brought up on charges of discrimination against black women and General Motors in its defense said, we don't discriminate against black women. Look at all these women we hire or we have as employees. They're white women, but they're women. And then look at all these blacks we have as employees. They're black men, but they're black. So they were able to say, we don't discriminate against blacks or women. Of course, that doesn't address whether they discriminated against black women who fall at the intersection. They're neither white women nor black men. So intersectionality is supposed to you know, teach us that there are all kinds of often worse forms of discrimination that happen at the intersection between marginalized identities. I think feminists have taken that very seriously, uh, such that the, the, the fights that we're involved in are very different if you're, you know, a, like a poor woman of color in one context versus somebody like Taylor Swift. Um, Feminism today, there's ongoing battles about its proper scope and ambit. So, you know, increasingly there are divides among feminists, um, really heated divides. So gender critical feminists argue that feminism should be the fight to protect biological females. That's the proper fight for feminism. And then a lot of other feminists say, no, you know, feminism is again, a broader movement that ought to fight many forms of gender inequality and discrimination, including the kinds of gender inequality and discrimination that targets minority genders like transgender people and non-binary people um, and not just women. Um, so that, that's very much like an ongoing kind of um, internal fight within feminism now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to ask you uh, I think two follow-up questions to that. So uh, 
first of all, do you think that, uh, I think I've already had uh, this discussion with someone on the show, but do, do you agree that perhaps some of the issues that women face have also evolved over time and that over time we have to become aware of certain new issues like, for example, I mean, I don't know uh, what are your views personally on things like, for example, sex work, like uh, working in in the porn industry or being a prostitute. I mean, th there are different feminists have different views on that, but nonetheless, uh, one could argue that, for example, nowadays with the existence of the internet and because um, there uh, there's evidence that uh, within those kinds of occupations there are, uh, for example, sex trafficking and people that are forced into them that perhaps the internet might feed some of that. So, I, I mean, through, in this particular case, the development of new technology, new issues might arise or get exacerbated. Would you agree with that? Yes, I definitely think that feminism has changed um, also with respect to some of those kind of classic feminist issues. I mean, there were always kind of disputes about whether sex work, work could be feminist, whether pornography or could be feminist. Yeah. But for the most part, feminism was on the side of these things are anti-feminist. They are not good for women. And now things are far less clear. Uh, I think there are a lot of feminists who think Feminism needs first and foremost to embrace women's agency and autonomy. And if that means for certain women that they want to enter into sex work and um, that they want to enter into pornography, then power to them. You know, feminism ought to respect their choices. And I, I think you could have a consistent feminism that both upholds women's individual agential choices to do that kind of work and that simultaneously questions the larger structure of society in which that kind of sexualization of the female body is as prevalent and desired as it is. I think you can, mm -hmm. you can hold those things together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the other follow-up question I had is, so you mentioned uh, the intersectionality framework there. Uh, when it comes to that, um, because I know there are feminists who would disagree with this, but what are your views on including trans women specifically in the feminist movement? Because I know there are some feminists out there who sometimes are called uh, TERFs, that is trans-exclusionary radical feminists or some other equivalent term that do not think or do not agree that trans women should be part of the feminist movement. So what is your position on that since you also seem to come from an intersectionality perspective uh, do you think yes. that intersectionality also extends to uh, such gender identities, I think, I guess? Yes, I think that feminism ought to include trans women within its fight um, for various reasons. One obvious reason is that much of the battles that trans women face are not entirely different in kind from the battles that cisgender women face either. So, um, you know, stereotypes, gendered expectations about what it means to be a woman, those things will affect both cis women and trans women alike. Um, but they obviously also face different battles. And, you know, the, the gender critical feminists are especially concerned about the ways in which those, those um, the battle for cis women and the battle for trans women kind of bump up against each other. Um, but I think that feminism's proper concern is for 
for all kinds of women. Um, I do also want to add though that this is a point about kind of the way that the academic um, conversation has, has gone. I think it's unfortunate that gender critical feminists are kind of labeled as, as TERFs, which I agree with them that that's effectively become a slur. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that we need to be able to have more productive actual conversation around these really thorny issues between gender criminal, gender critical feminists and more trans inclusive feminists. Um, because also just as philosophers, I think everybody needs to practice the, the virtue of charitability and uh, assume that people are really trying to come from the best place when they're working for justice issues. Um, and I think all too often in these conversations, that assumption is, is not um, brought forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and since you come from this intersectional point of view, uh, do you think that uh, when thinking about issues and challenges that women have to deal with nowadays, uh, I mean, we should also uh, think about, uh, for example, their place of origin if they live in particular countries, in particular regions of the globe. Uh, I guess that women in different places would face different challenges, right? So, I mean, we have also, uh, as feminists, you also have to take that into account that perhaps the challenges faced by women, I don't know, in the Middle East or Africa or some other places are uh, different. It, it could be more or less challenging, I don't know, than the US or the Western world in general, correct? Yes, yes, certainly. And I think that um, even if we're speaking just broadly in general terms, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at the, the kind of plight that um, women are facing globally, you know, in many countries, you know, in, in Africa, but, um, you know, in other continents as well, um, they are, you know, a, a, a fights that have been won in many places in, in the US, like fights for um, basic education for young women against child marriage, forced female genital cutting, like, com, you know, compulsory veiling, things like that. that um, and so, you know, it's, it's certainly very important to attend to context when discussing feminism and, and the particular battle that feminists are involved in. Um, yeah. So I would like to get now, uh, since of course you're also an academic, I would like to get now more into some issues that perhaps from the point of view of an academic, uh, are, we also have to take into account. So. What, what are epistemic exclusions? What does that term mean? Yeah, so epistemic exclusions are uh, what happens when knowers or you know, people with relevant knowledge are left out of or excluded from forms mm -hmm. of inquiry in which they belong. So epistemic, mm -hmm. you know, from the Greek episteme, meaning to know, so exclusions on the basis of knowledge. And there's been a really huge literature spawned mostly because of a book written by Miranda Fricker on epistemic injustice that is now concerned with all kinds of wrongs and injustices done specifically to people in their capacity as, as knowers. Mm -hmm. um, there is certainly internal debate um, about you know, whether or not those kinds of injustices she describes are you know, really epistemic injustices. Are they, are they really not just moral injustices that have to do with knowledge? And it gets kind of thorny and, and nerdy there. But in any case, big literature <laughs> on this question. And, and epistemic exclusions in particular um, are what happens when, when people are left out in various ways from, from inquiry. 
And by being left out, I mean, how does that manifest exactly within academia? I mean, could it be, uh, does, or does that include, for example, uh, female students not participating so much uh, in the classroom, not raising their hands to participate, I don't know, in debates or to pose questions or to raise issues? Uh, does it include mm -hmm. that? Does it include, for example, uh, being harder for women to uh, publish in particular academic journals or to, uh, or, or for example, even if they do so for their work to be taken as seriously as the work of men? I mean, is, are those some of uh, the examples of uh, epistemic exclusion, uh, are those all examples of epistemic exclusion? Yeah, good question. So I think, I think a lot of those are examples of epistemic exclusions. So I typically think of epistemic exclusions as, you know, a, a kind of injustice done to somebody because they, they have a bit of knowledge um, to contribute or an entire research paradigm or whatever mm -hmm. it may be that's then ignored or dismissed or undermined various ways of being excluded. Um, and, and I guess I hesitate to think of the phenomenon of like women contributing less in class and raising their hands less as a kind of epistemic exclusion, although I might mm -hmm. need to rethink that question. Um, the, 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 the cause of that epistemic exclusion is, is complicated, right? It, it okay. could be in, internalized sexism. It could be the in, internalized sense that what I have to say is not valuable um, and that that could be traced back to kind of sexist stru structure, in which case maybe it would make sense to think of that as an epistemic exclusion as well. Um, that, that's, that's something I haven't thought of and, it, and it's interesting. Um, other examples of epistemic exclusions are not listening to a woman's input because uh, she's, you know, overly emotional or, you know, she's just being hormonal. Let's not take seriously what she's saying. Um, you know, lots of women have faced difficulty being being believed, having their testimony accepted, um, you know, when, especially when they bring forward claims of sexual assault, like sex workers in particular have faced this struggle. Yeah. Um, and historically, you know, indigenous women's knowledge has been excluded, women's contributions to intellectual history have been excluded. And in the scientific realm, there have been a lot of exclusions. Um, so, you know, famously, there was a British chemist named um, Rosalind Franklin, who made pretty major contributions to the structure of DNA, but those contributions went pretty much unnoticed. Um, there was also uh, the scientist Barbara McClintock, who discovered genetic transposition or jumping genes, and her work also went um, mostly ignored during her lifetime, although 30 years later she won the Nobel Prize for that um, research. And, and today, feminists argue this is still a problem. There actually was just an article in Nature published last year. It was entitled, um, Women Are Credited Less in Science Than Men. And it claims that even to this day, women's scientific contributions are excluded in, in various ways. So, so certain, so I think, I think my, my considered answer actually is that all of, all of the examples you gave probably would qualify as, as epistemic exclusions. So, I mean, these are, when it comes to epistemic exclusion, the examples you gave are probably illustrative of some of one issue that we talked about earlier, that is, when it comes to some people claiming that feminism, specifically in the West nowadays, is obsolete and in academia specifically because, uh, I mean, women can go to college, they can study in university, they can take whatever kind of degree they want, they can publish papers and books and be professors and all of that, that it, there's no longer 
uh, an issue there, let's say, but uh, it can still be through those kinds of uh, occurrences and manifestations, right? Yes. Uh, so even if formal inequality doesn't exist anymore, let's just you know, accept that, that doesn't mean that informal kinds of inequality or discrimination don't persist. And that's certainly much of what feminists and more kind of progressive um, democratic societies try to draw our attention to a lot of the time. Although, as you noted earlier, there are now more formal um, obstacles to women's um, flourishing than there have been um, in recent years, such as with the abortion bans and, you know, in the case of transgender people, for sure, in the U.S., there is um, a, there are, are many laws now coming into existence that are also like formal obstacles and, um, for trans people's, um, you know, rights to live and, and flourish. So, again, I mean, a lot of feminists today say that our focus really should be on gender minorities, um, given that their battles are especially kind of acute and egregious, but um, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the historical exclusion of women's knowledge that you mentioned there at a certain point uh, also occurred and perhaps still occurs, I'm not sure, uh, within philosophy? I mean, since you are a philosopher yourself. Yeah, good question. I think definitely in the history of uh, philosophy, um, you know, women's uh, contributions have, you know, not always been valued. And there have been efforts among, you know, feminists um, today to kind of resuscitate some of the insights from earlier feminist philosophers like Hypatia, for instance, um, and, and many others. Um, so yes, I think it's happened within philosophy um, and you know, in other domains for sure. Um, I think that things are far improved today. I mean, I know that it, it's common to claim that you know women still face many obstacles within the the discipline to being taken seriously, um, but I, I'll admit that um, I'm, I'm skeptical of, of some of those claims. Um, I think that things have vastly improved um, for women in, in philosophy. Uh, but do you think that when it comes to this kind of exclusion, uh, it's just a matter of, uh, I mean, the injustice itself of excluding women from participation in knowledge production, or, I mean, even from uh, an epistemic point of view and from the point of view of uh, developing knowledge and uh, for the evolution of knowledge, I mean, uh, having basically half of the human population historically, for the most part, excluded from the production mm -hmm. of knowledge, also contrib or might have contributed to its impoverishment in a way. I mean, is Absolutely. that also an issue? Absolutely. Oh, one hundred percent. Yes. So, so the exclusion of women's knowledge is not only bad and wrong for the sake of the women who are excluded, but for the sake of the knowledge enterprise itself, definitely. So, and that's what feminist epistemologists and feminist philosophers of science have tried to argue that for the sake of science, right, we need to include women and science was worse on account of having excluded women like Rosalind Franklin and like Barbara McClintock because the research was worse, right? Women drew our attention to um, things that we missed. And that's so, so our, our actual not, uh, achievements are, are marred by the exclusion too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, I remember reading at a certain point that uh, 
uh, when it comes to attributing the Nobel Prize, they attributed it to Marie Curie as well. But originally, apparently, they only wanted to attribute it to, to attribute it to Pierre Curie, and then it was he himself that said that he wouldn't accept it if they wouldn't include his wife. That, that's, oh. I guess, an example, right? I didn't know that. Good for him. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. So uh, th that's about epistemic exclusions. But, uh, but when it comes to epistemic inclusions, are, are there also injustices in that department, I guess? I mean, because one would think that if we are epistemically including women, that would always be positive or not. So yes, I've argued that while it's important to attend to the ways that we exclude women knowers and other knowers from inquiry, we also need to attend to the ways that including those knowers might also be less than just. So one example, imagine that you're a researcher and you've published an article and you're ready to send it off to the journal. And then you look at the bibliography and you realize, oh no, I don't have any minority scholars on my bibliography. And I know that this journal really values citing a diverse array of scholars, so I better find some. And then so that researcher kind of scrambles and looks for some minority sounding names to throw in a couple footnotes just so that they can get them on the bibliography. That's a kind of inclusion, but I would say it's an unjust kind of epistemic inclusion because they haven't really seriously engaged the work of those authors. They kind of just went to them to be able to add them to their citation page and they're really being objectified or used, uh, instrumentalized in that case. So I would say the wrong there is that this is a kind of instrumentalization not really compatible with treating those scholars as fully equal inquirers. Um, so that would be a kind of inclusion that actually is unjust. And then there are other sorts of epistemic inclusions that actually serve to exclude more than they include. So another kind of common trend is for people to go to like the member of um, one my uh, one member of a minority, like yeah. a, a racial minority, let's say, or a woman, or a, you know a trans individual, and then allow them to speak for the whole, right? To be mm. spokespeople for their entire group, like well, and. Um, what you're doing then, if you were to say, well, I, I spoke to my, you know, my black friend and that person said that, you know, all black people think the following or they wouldn't put it quite like that. But that's effectively the, the move is to pretend like you are speaking for um, or including the perspectives of a large group of people um, just because you solicited the input of one member of that group. So that's another way in which an epistemic inclusion can actually mask what's really an exclusion. So, for example, when people uh, on media or alternative media, even sometimes on the internet, uh, find someone that is part of a particular minority group that uh, espouses particular views that usually promote uh, policies, for example, that go against the interests of the majority of people that are part of that group, that would probably constitute an example of epistemic inclusion that is not uh, good, right? I mean, and, and that, that could work both ways, right? I mean, I, I would imagine that even uh, just because you include someone where who is very good uh, intentioned and uh, to promote what she thinks are the interests of the majority of people of their group I mean, even if it has uh, overall a positive effect, uh, you shouldn't perhaps assume that uh, what that person says and thinks is representative of what every single person of that group also thinks and feels and says. Yes, right. yes definitely. And, and 
members of those minority groups or marginalized groups yeah. are often very frustrated when they witness being spoken for in that mm -hmm. way because you know these are uh, if we're talking about race and gender and religion i mean we're talking about massive groups of people there's a ton of internal diversity within those groups yeah. and in fact it's part of the logic of discrimination to mask that diversity to try to treat those groups as if they're uniform in some way as if all the people are the same in some way so there's a sense in which the speaking for yeah. kind of rehashes the very discriminatory logic that we're trying to fight against so i think it's it's always imperative to draw attention to the the internal diversity among people within these groups there is there is disagreement um, of course and um, you know there there's much to be learned from um, from you know talking to as many you know groups uh, individuals as possible within groups in order to get a sense of that diversity Mm -hmm. And also because I would imagine that another way this kind of thing would be pernicious is it doesn't matter really what kind of position a particular person would be expressing. It could be, I don't know, even from a minority group, someone who is right wing or left wing or whatever, it doesn't matter. But I, I mean, if people are exposed to one single person or a handful of people, who all of them say that they believe in, they have these or these or that sort of political beliefs, for example, then people who watch them might think, oh, okay, so this is a reasonable X person, a reasonable, I don't know, trans person, a reasonable black person something like that or and the the rest of them if some if someone among them says something different they are unreasonable why uh, right 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 so yeah exactly that narrative can serve to like further marginalize people within the group who don't share that share the narrative you know ascribed to the group as a whole even though that in itself is is a misguided thing to do because we're talking mm -hmm. about huge groups of people. I mean, it might be one thing if it was a small enough group, but we're talking about like millions of people in some of these cases. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, also because I guess that in this case, what people consider reasonable or unreasonable, I mean, it's just basically someone who says something they agree with, right? So. Right, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then they'll hold that person up, be like, see, this is what everybody in that group thinks. Like, no, that's just what you want to be able to say. Uh, and it is a frustrating experience. I mean, I've, I've witnessed this, you know, as a woman, people will kind of say, well, you know, women, um, you know, believe the, this or, you know, just this kind of really general sweeping claim like that. And um, it's, it's always just, you know, kind of jarring because you know it's like well wait a minute i don't i don't think that am i not part of this group um yeah so uh changing topics uh i would also like to ask you about cultural appropriation and i guess here of course we'll get into some of the the common notions that people have of cultural appropriation but before we get into that and uh, how your position differs perhaps from some of those more common views. Uh, tell us then uh, what does cultural appropriation mean for you? So on my view, like cultural appropriation takes place when a cultural outsider you know, borrows a style or practice that was developed by or you know popularized uh, within another culture often a minority culture so that could be a hairstyle that could be a clothing style that could be a musical style that mm -hmm. could be a food recipe um, tons of examples in the media all the time about cultural appropriation you know whether it be kim kardashian 
getting accused of cultural appropriation for wearing like Fulani braids, which is a protective hairstyle um, among the Fulani people of West Africa or uh, Iggy Azalea, an Australian white rapper getting accused of culturally appropriating from black hip hop musicians or there were a few years, a couple years ago, there was a white high school student in the US who went viral for wearing a traditional Chinese dress or chipao um, to prom. So tons and tons of examples. Um, I think the term cultural appropriation is used in everyday parlance to have a, a negative connotation, like cultural appropriation is by definition wrong. Uh, in the philosophical literature, it's employed more neutrally. So cultural appropriation mm -hmm. kind of just describes any um, act of exchange from, you know, uh, a cult from one cultural member kind of to another. Um, so that can get a bit confusing because I think that there's a distinction there between how the terms are used. I, I argue that we should employ the neutral understanding of cultural appropriation. And then when it goes wrong, I call that cultural misappropriation. Oh, okay. So uh, that, that's a, a very important distinction there because I mean, uh, I guess that um, usually people outside of the academic circle, let's say, when they hear the term cultural appropri appropriation nowadays by being exposed to some, I guess, extreme examples on the media and stuff like that, they think, oh, that's just silly, ridiculous stuff that people on the left have invented or something like that uh, because it's ridiculous why can't i eat food that is that comes from that culture or wear clothes that comes from that culture over there i mean i'm not offending anyone uh, directly and that's not my intention so uh, i mean the, i guess that what i'm trying to say is that the sort of understanding that the general public as of cultural appropriation i mean people makes people very dismissive of the concept itself right yes i think i think that's true i think the term has like undergone this inflation now wherein you know most any instance of cultural exchange is assumed to be immoral in some way um, and it's called cultural appropriation and thought to be wrong for that reason um, and yet at the same time i think that everyday people kind of recognize that there are differences between different kinds of cultural appropriation or exchange yeah. and it's important to attend to those differences when making moral evaluations Mm -hmm. So, uh, in this case, um, I mean, what really distinguishes, uh, I guess I could, I could use the term here, positive cultural appropriation from cultural misappropriation? So, what are the criteria here and does it have, uh, do you focus here when you evaluate things, do you focus on the person who appropriates the appropriator or the the appropriation itself yeah good question so most approaches to cultural appropriation focus on the appropriation itself mm -hmm. um, when it, uh, in order to locate the wrong so you know, there are what I divide into two main approaches in the literature and philosophy, at least there are kind of toleration based approaches and power based approaches. So toleration based okay. approaches say it's not really about what the individual appropriator is doing, whether it's wrong depends on how widely tolerated the practice is among members of the cultural group being appropriated from. So if it is the case that, say, the Fulani people of West Africa do not support, you know, Kim Kardashian wearing Fulani braids because it's a protective hairstyle, then it would be wrong for that reason. It's not tolerated by the people. Um, Power-based approaches 
emphasize whether or not the appropriation, you know, manifests or exacerbates, you know, problematic power dynamics. So, you know, does Iggy Azalea playing her music um, enable her to get ahead, get famous, get rich, while Black hip hop musicians struggle against, you know, racism or other kinds of forces that preclude them from getting the same advantages? Yeah. That's what makes her appropriation wrong in that instance. So those are both cases that, those are both approaches that focus on the appropriation. I argue that we should focus more on the individuals themselves, the appropriators, than anything else when it comes to determining whether or not the cult act of cultural appropriation is wrong. So I defend an agent-based approach to cultural appropriation. And I think you know, when everyday people are evaluating cases of cultural appropriation, they often are attending to the agent. They're trying to evaluate whether that person is engaged in a respectful um, use of another culture's product. So that high school student I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of people on social media were saying, well, it doesn't seem like she was wearing that dress in a disrespectful manner. Um, she obviously really loved the dress and thought it was beautiful. And there were some people and, you know, members of, um, or Chinese people as well who defended her right to wear that dress. And, and I argue that 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 is the right focus. We should we should look to the individual and evaluate whether or not they are exhibiting some form of disregard, whether that be disrespect or indifference or ignorance in their use of the cultural product. Um, so we can definitely think of examples in which that it's clear that the appropriator is failing to be adequately respectful. So mm -hmm. an appropriator uh, who wears a Native American headdress, for instance, um, is being disrespectful because Native American headdresses are uh, specifically worn by selected honorable people uh, within Native, Native American cultures. They earn that right. It's really difficult to imagine an outsider wearing a Native American headdress then in a manner that would be consistent with respecting, you know, the members of the relevant Native American tribe, for instance. Um, and, you know, I think what, what's helpful about my approach is that it draws our attention to the attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs of individuals. And I think that's good because cultural appropriation is everywhere. You can't avoid cultural appropriating. In a multicultural society, we exchange our cultural um, products all of the time. I mean, we're constantly involved in borrowing from other cultures. And I think that is a good thing. It is a good thing for a thriving multicultural society. And we don't want to be so quick to police people's abilities to exchange across cultures. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I mean, since I talk with lots of anthropologists on the show, uh, I don't know what you would think about this, but perhaps there are two different ways through which anthropology would help here. So one of them would be, as you have just mentioned, I mean, a culture is not uh, a monolith and there are no uh, strict barriers between different cultures. I mean, there's cultural ex exchange and transmission uh, all the time between different cultures, across different cultures. I mean, that's just inevitable and no one can do anything about that. And I, I, it's even a positive thing because it enriches all cultures that participate in it, I guess. That, that's one point. And the other point, I mean, for example, you mentioned their uh, objects used by indigenous people. And I would imagine that perhaps one of the ways when it comes to um, cultural misappropriation, one of the ways that or one of the things that people should take into account is that there are certain things that are part, for example, of specific rituals that uh, occur in particular cultures. 
uh, like for example headdresses or any other kinds of objects or even for example tat tattoos that people have to perform the ritual in a particular way according to particular rules uh, observed by particular people uh, and I mean if someone was to use whatever kind of object associated with that or just do a tribal tattoo on their arm or on their arm or something like that. I mean, in that particular case, perhaps they should take into account that that might be actually offensive to people who are part of that particular culture. Because uh, I, I mean, you if you want that, you really have to go through the normal ritual or cultural process, whatever through which uh, those things get uh, expressed right yes and the only thing i would i would clarify is that you know the the wrong maker in that case is not so much the causing of offense but the reason for the offense and i mm -hmm. make that distinction yeah. because there's you know other accounts of cultural appropriation that say we ought not to culturally appropriate, you know, if it causes offense. And I think that view is misguided for a couple of reasons. Okay. One, you could be doing something wrong, culturally misappropriative, and nobody's offended. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one problem. Another mm -hmm. is that um, you don't want to, you know, uh, hinge your the wrongness of cultural appropriation on other members offense because you know again they might not all be offended they might um you know uh, how do we start kind of adjudicating how many people's offense does it take um you know and and i think that can start to get messy so it's like the reason for the offense um is well this is a this is a culturally protected practice it symbolizes the following like this is this is the reason why it is it is wrong Right, so uh, changing topics now, uh, you're working on a book about the ethics of identity. We're of course not getting into the content of the book itself here, but uh, from the work you've been doing, what is the ethics of identity? What sorts of questions does it deal with? So the ethics of identity broadly concerns, you know, moral and immoral ways to hold an identity. I mean, another major part of the ethics of identity concerns defining what identity even is. That's a you know, huge part of the conversation too. But the sorts of questions it deals with that I'm especially interested in are questions like, you know, um, when is it always wrong to lie about your racial background? Um, when do we owe people the truth about, say, our birth sex or our parents' race, sorts of things? Um, to what degree should people's self-identities be beholden to social norms and expectations about those identities? Okay, so, uh, and uh, let's focus on one kind of identity here today. So, from your point of view, from the point of view you come from, uh, how do you understand race? What does race mean? Good question. So, there are there are three main positions in the the philosophical race debate. Yeah. Um, there, those are racial anti-realism, biological racial realism, social racial realism. Um, and I can tell you a bit, a bit about each of those. So mm -hmm. in my own book and my work on the topic of transracialism in particular, I explore you know, whether and how transracialism is possible on different conceptions of race. So I kind of don't um, you know, endorse a particular understanding of race. I just defend transracial identity and the possibility of transracialism based mm -hmm. on varying conceptions of race. Uh, back to your question, um, it, do, 
I can just lay out the debate a little a little bit between those views. Uh, yeah, basically within the philosophy of race, what are yeah. the different positions out there? Okay, so there are three main positions within philosophy of race, racial anti-realism, biological racial realism, and social racial realism. Yeah. So racial anti-realists argue that race properly defined uh, refers to subspecies, like biologically meaningful divisions within the human species. And so defined, so properly understood, races don't exist. There are no such thing as human subspecies, right? There is biological diversity within the human species, but it's not of the kind that it would need to be for there to be something like races or subspecies, and therefore races aren't real, hence the anti-realism, right? The racial anti-realism. Racial anti-realists, though, do think that there are what they call racialized groups, groups of people erroneously believed to be members of races. Okay. So that's that's one position. And then the, the social racial realists and the biological racial realists agree that races do exist um, and they do refer, right? So mm -hmm. they're not anti-realist in that sense. They just disagree about the nature of race. So okay. biological racial realists think, yeah, races exist and they are biological in nature. Now, they don't think that those are like biologically deep um, kinds of, uh, that, that they don't think it's a biologically deep um, difference between the races. It's biologically superficial, but it's still biological in nature. Mm -hmm. The social racial realists think, no, it's social in nature. The, the, what the races fundamentally are, are categories defined by humans throughout culture, throughout history, in line with different purposes. Um, and, and yet it is social. So for instance, the social racial realist will say, look, you know, when it was convenient for expanding the slave trade, the one drop rule of black racial membership said all you needed is one African ancestor to be black. Yeah. And, you know, so somebody who had a one drop of black blood on this view would be black. And that's a social phenomenon. That's not saying anything meaningful about, you know, what one African ancestor actually makes you, uh, you know, as, as far as your biology is concerned. And the same thing was true, like with the Nuremberg laws in Nazi Germany. It was like, here are the rules for, you know, for being classified as Jewish. And uh, social racial realists will say, well, you, you know, you are black and are Jewish uh, in those contexts, according to those rules, um, but those are social, socially determined. So, uh, I mean, several different things about that. First of all, it's interesting to notice that both the um, anti-realists and the biological race realists uh, base their arguments, uh, I, I mean, their arguments come from a biological basis, right? But they come to different conclusions because the anti-realists are also basing their arguments on biology to say, so from a biological standpoint, there's no really any good basis for us to talk about human races or to distinguish or categorize people into different races, but the biological realists are basically saying the opposite. E even though, uh, and th this is my second observation, at a certain point you said there that the uh, biological realists um, do not think that perhaps the differences cut too deep, that they are mostly superficial, but what does that mean exactly? I mean, does that mean that, for example, uh, they only uh, consider uh, some anatomical differences like skin color, for example? Be because uh, I'm asking you that because when I think about uh, 
bio, biological realism applied to race, I also tend to associate it with people that talk about, for example, IQ differences oh. and other psychological differences and sometimes make claims about the um, different kinds of culture being intrinsically associated with different oh. races. Like, for example, sometimes uh, we hear people making claims about uh, African-American people in the U.S. not uh, uh, li li living more in, uh, in poverty than whites because they have a particular kind of culture that they say is intrinsic to their race. So, I, I mean, the, does, do the philosophers who come from a biological realist perspective uh, associated to race also make those kinds of arguments or are they just focusing more on, on more superficial stuff, let's say? Yeah, that's a great question. So they're certainly focused on very different arguments. Um, so okay. two of the most prominent biological racial realists in philosophy are actually African-American. So Quayshawn Spencer and Michael Hardiman. Um, okay. And, you know, they, they both argue that you know, genetic sampling programs just do reveal that there are, you know, ways that we can um, distinguish the people into races, like biologically speaking. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Hardiman calls his concept of race minimalist race to denote the fact that the biological differences there are minimal. So, you know, he says that, look, um, the races do exist and are divided um, because they capture kind of um, patterns of physical features like nose shape and hair type and skin color that are biological, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet they're biologically superficial, right? And so they're kind of minimal, he says. He says that they're not a big biological deal. Okay. And yet they're still biological. And he thinks, again, that the genetic sampling programs kind of like prove that these are real, but again, biologically minimal um, groupings. So they would in no way justify, you know, some of the more... Um, radical uh, conclusions about you know race and IQ for instance or mm -hmm. other other examples that you gave but yeah I know that the the there are certainly a lot of different ways of being a biological racial realist um, and uh, I think a lot of people assume that the only way to be one is to be kind of on that more extreme end but that's certainly mm -hmm. not not the case at all and like again you know Quayshawn Spencer and Michael Hardiman's work among others shows that yeah, I asked you that question just because I had I wanted to understand if these positions associated with, for example, IQ and other psychological traits and culture is something that we see among uh, certain kinds of, for example, social scientists or just among them, or if you also get that with some philosophers of race. Oh, definitely. There are definitely some philosophers of race okay. also who have a kind of more hard line in biological racial realism, um, who think that there are like biologically significant divisions between the races, even significant enough that they um, could um, provide, uh, uh, that, that they could explain um, differences between the races, uh, you know, at the level of IQ and other other sorts of, of things like that. Yeah, there, there are some philosophers who think that too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, one more question associated with what you said earlier. So about the social realists. So mm -hmm. uh, they are social realists, so they attribute some sort of reality to the concept of race, but in that case, it's real as a social construct, correct? Yes. 
Precisely. Yes, it's real as a social construct, you know, meaning that um, we as people kind of determine it's the, the reality. That doesn't mean that it's any less real. In mm -hmm. fact, we are very powerful. And yet social constructionists or social racial realists, I'll use those terms interchangeably, think races are social categories in that they don't carve nature at its joints, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Humans are the ones who come up with the rules for these categorizations. Yeah, uh, and then there are some people who have a sort of blended view um, between social realism and biological realism. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to ask you that quick question because uh, I don't want to get into the broader metaphysical discussion about what's real and what it's not. It falls outside of the scope of this interview, of course, but it's still interesting to um, just observe that uh, when it comes to that kind of discussion, there are people who argue that social constructs are not real things, but there are other people who argue the opposite and say that, uh, I mean, whatever kind of social construct we operate under is also uh, a real thing, right? Yes, yes. It would be a mistake to conflate like the social constructionist and the anti-realist because mm -hmm. the, the social constructionist thinks these constructions are very much real and have real effects and you know often devastating effects um, on people and so um, they are very much still realists. So uh... Getting into the issue of transracialism and if someone can change their race, just to introduce the topic, I would like to understand. So out of these three positions, where do you come from to tackle this issue? So I, I argue that, you know, transracialism is kind of possible on a variety of uh, uh, views in the race literature. So mm -hmm. I don't like myself endorse a particular account okay. of race. I mostly want okay. to show that transracialism is possible first off on the most popular conception of race, the social racial realist view. And you know, a lot of people, most of the people in fact who say transracialism, transracialism is not possible identify as social racial realists or social constructionists. So one of my main goals is to show it's possible on social racial realism properly understood. I also argue it's possible on the anti-realist view because it's just that we would have to frame what transracial individuals are doing a bit differently. I would say for the anti-realist, transracial people are moving from one racialized group to another rather than from one race to another. The biological racial realist will deny the possibility of transracialism. And yet, even biological racial realists like Michael Hardiman, for instance, acknowledge that the biological race concept can't do all the work we need it to do. We also need a social race concept because he grants that there are racial categories out there that don't really map neatly onto the minimalist race concept he comes up with. So um, and it, even for biological racial realists, they kind of see that the, like, the dominant race concept is a social race concept. And that, so I, my point is really to say transracialism is possible across a lot more race concepts than people would otherwise imagine. So if someone can change their you use the term racial category instead of race, correct? Um, well, great. race is fine. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Let's go with race then. So if someone can change their race and you, you say you come mostly from a social realist perspective, if I understand it correctly, what does that mean? Exactly. I mean, what does it mean for someone to change their race? So, good question. So, yeah, so let's take the social realist 
um, view of race. So, you know, let's let's take a particular uh, example, maybe. So, mm -hmm. lots of people think that there aren't transracial people. First off, that you know that these people don't exist, and mm -hmm. that's not true. There are transracial identified people. There are more out there than than folks tend to assume. Um, one transracial identified person recently published a book actually called White Girl Within. Uh, their name is Ronnie Gladden, and they were born a black male and identify as a white woman and have even taken like certain steps to try to align their racial self presentation with their racial identity. So like lightening their skin or attempting to and, and you know, various other efforts to align their presentation with their racial identity. Mm -hmm. So I think we could say that Gladden is transracial in that, you know, as a kid, Gladden was a black man, right, according to the racial rules. And uh, we could we could say, and I'll clarify um, the caveat in a moment, that today, you know, Gladden um, is uh, a white woman, um, according to the rules of racialization um, of our given society. Now, I say there's a caveat because for the social realist, an individual can't just change race by themselves, right? It's a social phenomenon that requires that, that the racial membership criteria are such that it's possible to Ha to be a member of a race despite lacking the relevant ancestry. So for the social realist, there would need to be a, a change in our everyday approach to race that says you can be a member of a racial group, you know, even if you don't have the ancestry, um, maybe if you meet other criteria like self-identification criteria or things like that. So the question of what it means to change race is really complicated depending on the particular view of race that you have, right? If you're a social realist, you think mm -hmm. that the social rules are going to have to accommodate or change in order to make it possible. And if you are somebody who thinks race is more about an individual property, uh, then you don't need this sort of social uptake in order for race change to be possible. So, I, I mean, uh, ju just to see if I got if I got clear some of what you said, um, to be able to change one's race, can the person do it by herself, or does it have to be recognized by society more generally? I think on a social constructionist view of race, a person cannot change race by themselves. Okay. Because whether or not a person is a member of a certain race really does depend on whether they meet the social criteria deemed necessary to be a member of that race. And if ancestry remains a criterion for racial membership in our society as it currently does, then it won't be possible to change race on a social realist, realist view. Um, and so, you know, it, it's analogous in certain ways to, to gender in that um, there has been a push to de-emphasize biological sex as a criterion for gender, uh, me gendered membership, right, or gender identity. And, you know, transracial individuals, you know, hope for a time when r race is also more accommodating toward people who lack the relevant ancestry. So we've been talking about if it's possible or not for someone to change their race. But another different kind of question is, should it be possible for someone to change their own race? I mean, what do you think are some of the more relevant ethical questions associated with this? Mm 
Yes, good, really important question. So I do think it should be possible for certain people to change their race. I think it should be possible for transracial identified people to change their race. Um, if doing so will alleviate the kind of racial dysphoria they experience and will enable them to flourish more as members of the identity group with which they, uh, to which they feel they belong. Um, I will say that that doesn't mean that there are no ethical limits on transracial identity, right? So I think that um, there are more or less ethical ways of holding a transracial identity. I don't think that it's permissible to like feed really harmful racist stereotypes, for instance, in the holding of one's transracial identity. And to say that it should be possible to change race doesn't mean that we treat all transracial people the exact same way as cisracial people either, right? So it wouldn't follow, for instance, that a transracial black person should be entitled to like the exact same benefits and entitlements as a cisracial black person, such as, for instance, like scholarships that are intended specifically to redress centuries of inequality mm -hmm. based on having a certain kind of ancestry, right? So ancestry is important for certain affirmative action purposes. And in those cases, it would not be appropriate to just treat transracial people the same way. And, you know, it, it's really important that we get the ethics right because there are lots of ways that, that these, uh, that these kinds of identities could be abused or insincerely held, of course, um, for the sake of trying to gain certain advantages. And yet there are people who sincerely hold these identities and we need to um, you know, think about what our ethical obligations to those individuals are and what their obligations are to themselves too. Like, mm -hmm. what does it mean to hold um, an identity authentically and what does it mean to have to kind of pretend that one does not hold that identity. Uh, and I mean, if this is really a social process and if uh, other people, society in general, has to also recognize the race, racial identity of a particular person that changed their race, uh, I mean, when it comes to changing one's race, what would that entail exactly? I, I mean, would it entail, for example, uh, just um, participating uh, in some sort of uh, cultural manifestations that are usually associated with uh, the yeah. race one wants to change to? Would it, would it also necessarily imply changing one's uh, physical appearance according to what is socially understood as being a person of a particular race or falling under a particular racial category? Are, are those questions that you also think about and we, you think we should address in this issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really important and good questions. I think what race change will involve will vary depending on you know, the individual transracial person. So some transracial people do seek to like change their self presentation to like align more with the race they identify with. Others don't feel the need or desire to do that and they feel more like um, just uh, familiarizing themselves and kind of becoming more um, at one with like the the relevant culture associated with the, the racial group that they occupy is maybe more more important to, to them. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it really will vary and I wouldn't put any like moral restrictions on like how one ought to be to kind of hold a transracial identity. Mm -hmm. And I'll add too that like there are a lot of different ways of being transracial. So if we think of transracial identity broadly as just holding a racial identity that uh, 
holding a racial identity, thinking oneself of oneself as a member of a race different from your presumed race, then you know there are actually a lot more ways of being transracial than we might suspect. So, you know, there there are the obvious case of being like transracial in the sense of identifying as one race, uh, identifying or moving from the member being a member of one race to another, but then there are other kinds of examples too. So I would say that, you know, the mixed race artist, Adrian Piper in 2012 released a, um, a, a book and, and a statement that said, henceforth my racial designation will be neither black nor white, but 6.25% gray. And I would say that that's a kind of transracial identity. It's transracial in what Rogers Brubaker has called the trans of beyond. So Brubaker divides um, different ways of being trans into three categories, like the trans of um, migration, that's moving from like one race or gender to another, the trans of between, that's kind of like existing somewhere between, you know, the um, conventional racial or gender categories. And then there's a the trans of beyond, just like challenging the categories themselves entirely. Um, and I think you can be, transracial and transgender, in fact, in these, these different ways, um, because you know, there are a lot of different ways of not holding the racial uh, identity that um, is associated with your presumed race. Um, so there are, um, there's quite a bit of variety within the category. Um, okay, so we, we have then transracialism um, because uh, if ra if we treat race as a social construct and a social category, and gender also as a social construct and a social category, uh, I, I mean, do, do you think that there are, are ways by which we could think of uh, changing race as being? comparable or analogous to changing gender? Yes, yes. I think that changing race and changing gender are analogous in certain ways that can be illuminating and that can help uh, reveal inconsistencies in our thinking. Um, again, saying that they're analogous is not the same as, as saying that they're identical. They're still very different kind of phenomena, but there are relevant analogies, certainly. And I think for, for most folks skeptical of transracialism, they in fact defend the claim that gender is a social construct and that race is a social construct. And so it's, it's surprising in a way to deny the analogy there. Um, usually they'll note that there are different kinds of social constructs. So, you know, one objection uh, that comes from Cressida Hayes says, well, the way that gender has been constructed is to locate all the, is to locate gender on the level of the individual body, whereas race as it's constructed doesn't locate race on the level of the individual body it kind of implicates others and implicates you know ancestry and all kinds of features that we just don't have control of um, and i would argue that to overemphasize like the particular features that the social construct has upheld risks actually getting us into the territory of the biological realist because the point about the social real the point about social realism is that we can change the criteria uh, we ultimately are the deciders of those criteria um, and so to say well you know transgender but not trans race because of ancestry is really to veer into the terrain of the biological realist and away from the social realist view Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I would like to get into one less topic than uh, you've also done some work on animal ethics. Uh, and nowadays, of course, when it comes to using uh, different animals in scientific research, there are uh, 
ethical guidelines and I mean people have to follow different protocols etc and people worry much more nowadays than they did before about animal welfare in general I think it would be fair to say but in one of your papers you argue not uh, again, not against particular uses of animals in animal, in scientific research or medical research, but uh, against the use of knowledge that comes from animal experimentation. So, could you explain that? Uh, yes. So, like, lots of animal ethicists argue that it's wrong to experiment on animals. Uh, they'll have different arguments to get to that conclusion, some that emphasize animals as rights holders whose you know, rights to not be killed and tortured are not upheld during animal experimentation, so it's wrong for that reason. Others argue that animal experimentation just causes enormous amounts of suffering and death to animals that is not justified by the kinds of results that animal experimentation yields. So results that are just too often of dubious relevance to humans. So I argue that you know, not only is animal experimentation wrong um, on uh, what uh, either view that you take in animal ethics, but that furthermore, using the results from animal experimentation is also wrong. Um, so I pull from debates over the use of um, data gained during the Holocaust <clears throat> because Nazis did a bunch of medical and scientific experiments on victims during the Holocaust, some of which has potentially useful results. And in fact, the Environmental Protection Agency years ago considered using results from Nazi experiments that tested the effects of phosgene gas on, I think, about 50 um, prisoners um, in preparation for like a possible phosgene attack um, against Germany. And the Environmental Protection Agency recognized that those results might be useful because we yeah. want to know the effects of phosgene gas on people, but we can't run those experiments. And ultimately, they decided not to. Um, use those um, results. And yet there are lots of debates about whether or not some of that data could be ethically used. Um, and I think those debates are different because in the case of the Nazi data, there's no risk that using the data now will somehow encourage people to perform like non-consensual fatal experiments on humans. Mm -hmm. And that's not true in the case of animals. So in the case of animal experimentation, you can't use the results and simultaneously condemn the practice of animal experimentation because the express purpose of animal experimentation is to gain those results. Um, so there's, there's no way of like using the results in a manner that like condemns or distances oneself from, from the practice. And in that way, it's, it's different from the use of the, of the Nazi data. Um, and you know, there, there, there are other arguments in that vicinity, um, that argue, well, the Nazi data should never be used because it's disrespectful. And I think that those are good arguments, but I think the best argument really is this point about how the use of the results just sustains the practice and that, that that's not the case in the, the use of Nazi data, but it very much is the case in the, in the use of animal experimentations results. But with that in mind, uh, I mean, do you think that uh, if you're correct, the end goal here should be to at least progressively eliminate animal experimentation altogether? Yes, yeah, 100%. That's what I think. And in fact, there have been like alternative um, alternatives to animal experimentation that have, um, you know, become um, increasingly popular. And I think that, you know, we ought to, um, we ought to, shift towards like the use of technology um, and 
uh, other means of um, gaining uh, information from um, animal experimentation. Um, so yes, I think animal experimentation should be eliminated as a practice. I think that um, you know, all too often the results are of dubious relevance. And, uh, and in fact, we have erred uh, in using the results from animal experimentation. Um, so famously, you know, um, thalidomide was tested on rats before it was um, brought to humans. And the results in mother rats were different from the results in pregnant humans. And um, Famously, like thalidomide babies were, you know, born with um, all sorts of deformities um, because, in part, the results from the animal experimentation were not reliable because animals and humans are, are different. There are also all kinds of alternatives to animal experimentation, and if we put our resources and focus into those, they would become even better. Um, than they already are. So, you know, human tissue in vitro testing, human stem cell research, microdosing technology. I mean, there's all kinds of alternatives out there that we could just employ more um, and not you know, engage in this torture of, of animals as we do. Um, okay, so uh, would you like, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, people can find me at my website. It's RebeccaTuvel.com. And yeah, feel free to reach out to me also at my my email, um, TuvelR at Rhodes.edu. And thanks so much for having me. No, it's been my pleasure. And I really do hope to have you again on the show whenever your upcoming book is out. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Um... Hi, guys. Thank you for watching the interview until the end. Please do not forget to share the video, subscribe to the channel, and also leave a like. And if you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You can find the links in the description box of the interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Diago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, João Linhares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hamel, Sardas France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazebski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, Simon Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morton Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Jorge Steofanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herringbone, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, the RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Bernabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, and Manuel Oliveira. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Vanagdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Turnbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis, and Al Nick Ortiz. And to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codrian, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.